Hey guys, uh, ramble time again because I've got a good couple of hours to be able to make a ramble because this drive is long. Uh, going to the Skeptic Feminist Murder Trial right now, the hearing for October 5th should be uh, two more officers giving their depositions, kind of similar to what happened last time. That's what I'm expecting, but they might go into uh, what the next hearing is about, which is a request for a new trial. So uh, tomorrow I'll recap what I see today in a video, but today I just wanted to ramble a little bit more about better help because last night I had a very uh, lively discussion with Misty about BetterHelp, and uh, yeah, we were discussing all the different points about like how they could be getting around the ethical problems that online counseling creates. So, first, I wanna I wanna recap. I've already gone over like for two videos now that BetterHelp creates. Uh, an unhealthy dual relationship with the people who enter into the sponsorship program because you're not supposed to have business dealings to advertise your company when you're a counseling company and you're counseling that person. You're not supposed to have two relationships with that person. It's under multiple relationships, bartering and pay, and uh, what was the other? Exploiting uh relationships, and that's kind of uh, dealing with the way that what their goal is in giving them therapy is creating that, you know, I'm not just the president for Hair Club for Men, I'm the client, I'm a client as well, style advertising, right? They want the fake uh, manufactured testimonial, and then they script it for them anyway. You know, you must read this, this, and this in your video in order to get paid. So, those are the things I've already talked about. Now I'm going to talk about an offshoot of the same situation there, where it's also uh, not ethically sound, right? So this, you know, we're, we're using a lot of the ethical guidelines in tandem because... Ethics cannot keep up with technology, and the law especially cannot keep up with technology, right? So we're, we're left to just use the ethical guidelines and, and come to conclusions ourselves after doing some really good soul searching here. So another ethical guideline I feel like still applies here is... It's best outlined in in ethics about the appropriate level of care and termination of care, right? So when you get somebody who's uh, applying to be a client of yours and you screen them and you decide whether or not you can give them the appropriate level of care that they need, the reasoning behind your decision as to whether you can give them the appropriate care primarily is whether or not they need care, okay? But in BetterHelp's sponsorship program, the YouTubers that have been uh, getting the free counseling in order to try it out, the primary reason for better help to give that counseling to them is not because they need help. It's because they need sponsees to pimp their product. Right? And because the primary reason for the level of care that they're getting is not whether or not they need care. It's more they're a big YouTuber with a large audience who can bring other clients to us. This creates another ethical violation, right? And in talking with Misty last night, uh, 
for those of you who don't know, Misty's a social worker, I'm a counselor. So we're both in the behavioral fields here. In talking with her last night, she brought up that maybe better help was getting around uh, these ethical guidelines by not being the provider of care, by considering themselves like a third-party connector to care. And I've seen this in other companies, such as American Addiction Centers, right? It's an umbrella group that, that connects a lot of different uh, highfalutin, you know, $5,000 a week, freaking sometimes $30,000 a month places, right? And whatever, whatever insurance you have, if you're in the same state as that place, they can connect you to it and have you on a flight to be there the next day. They are that good at connecting people to care. And they're great for people who have health insurance. They're also moving into the realm of people who have Medicaid and people who are be being cared for by the VA, which is awesome. If you're in my position where I'm trying to uh, get people connected to going into a treatment and they end up, you know, on a wait list for, uh, you know, weeks, if not months, waiting to get into a facility. I love that these people are really good at getting that commission and, you know, selling clients to addiction treatment centers and just getting people connected from A to B. They're really good at what they do, right? I love that aspect of it. But in those cases, these uh, headhunter companies, they are not the ones providing the care, right? They're, and they're not getting care from these uh, places. They are just a bunch of people who are really good at connecting people to care. So this, there, there is a ethical guideline about uh, third-party services in the APA uh, Code of Ethics as well. But, you know, things are left up to, you know, up to interpretation. These are not laws that people can break, you know, that are black and white. These are guidelines. And they're left vague intentionally, I think, so that people can't skirt the letter of them. You know, they're left uh, very broad. And I like that about the ethical guidelines because you can you can separate yourself from having to work for people who are willing to break ethics in order to make a dollar off people who are sick. So the, the reason why BetterHelp does not fit this description of third-party provider is, for one, in the contracts that they're giving to these sponsorship uh, YouTube channels, the free counseling is, is written into the contract. So it is part of the payment for them pimping their service. So they are the ones providing the, the counseling hours, even if they're connecting it to a contractor. And they are the ones who are taking payments directly from their clients. They don't uh, just, you know, get a, a finder's fee and then connect someone to somebody who's using a, you know, a mom pop shop to Skype them. No, they're connecting video chat style through BetterHelp, and BetterHelp is taking their cut of the you know the counseling hour pay for every hour that they're getting counseled. So BetterHelp is the organization providing the care, right? But they're acting as though they are protected from these ethical guidelines in that they're using contract work. Well, I'm going to use a, a now defunct 
group right now as my example, Arapaho House, which went under like a year and a half ago, right? They were the biggest treatment group in uh, Colorado, and they went under. They had on-call people who were direct employees of them, but they also had, just in case they were not able to fill a residential counseling uh, class with somebody who was able to uh, provide that care, they had the ability to call on-call contractors to come in and do classes for them, right? So would it be okay for those contractors to come and sell Girl Scout cookies in the middle of the class? Fuck no. Would it be okay for one of those contractors to, a month after giving a class to one of Arapaho House's clients, to meet them in a club and say, hey, I remember you. Hey, you want to dance? Fuck no. You know, would it be okay for them to, you know, be looking for somebody to put new roofing shingles on their roof after a hailstorm and then see that uh, one of the the people on the roofing team was going to be one of their ex-clients from one of the jobs that they were a contract worker for? Fuck no. Right? You, you, you have to avoid having a multiple relationship with people as best you can. And I understand that there are uh, exemptions for this in very rural areas. But better help being all over the fucking internet, it's basically like having a hundred times what a metro area would be as, as far as the, the clientele that are available in their uh, in their territory. Their territory is all over the fucking world. It's not just one little rural place. All over the world counts as their territory. They can find somebody to pimp their uh, service who has never used their service. Right? It is possible. But they would like to have that marketing edge of that little marketing technique of saying, you can trust me word of, word of mouth style because I've used the service before. Them wanting that edge in their marketing so that they can use it, a, a ploy of marketing is where I feel like they are chiefly uh, creating this eth ethical violation, right? So no, I don't think that they are uh, protecting themselves by uh, being a third party to the counseling, especially when they are very involved in the billing through just the initial uh, client contact. You know, I'm going into the uh, veteran memorial tunnels. I think this is the Eisenhower. There you go. There's some tunnel action there. Anyways. Um, now I want to say uh, a few things in BetterHelp's defense. Because just like there are those exemptions for rural areas as far as uh, having dual relationships because you, you're going to run into somebody that you've given counseling to because you're the only counselor in, you know, a 50 mile radius, you know, and you, you've got to have your car serviced by somebody. And the mechanic might have been a meth head, you know. I want to say some more things about how better help in rural areas can be a great fucking thing, right? I don't just want to shit on this service. So, from my perspective, I'm one of those people who wants 
a lot in my life. I'm a very materialistic person. Uh, I drive a nice truck. You guys are seeing the interior of it. I have enough money to go uh, to weird uh, hobbies of mine and spend like $80 in gas today. You know, um, I take vacations. I, you know, I dream about living in these mountains, in these mountain passes. And, uh, you know, one day being able to still work, but live in a weird mansion up in the mountains, right? And own a whole bunch of cars and whatnot. There are places in the state that, given a certain level of pay, you could live high on the hog, right? You could be living very well on the you know $15 an hour average that BetterHelp would give you, right? Mind you, when I worked for the now defunct Arapaho House, I got paid uh, a little bit less than $15 an hour while I was getting my certification hours. And there were a lot of people who already had their license that were getting paid around $15 an hour because it was a nonprofit, right? And they were having side gigs like driving for Uber and uh, they were working waitressing jobs on the side. They couldn't be bothered to be called in if somebody was sick to work some overtime because it would cut into their side gig and they wouldn't be able to afford to work there. That's how uh, the pay was working. You can't live in the metro area of any large city on the pay that nonprofit counseling will give you. Well, BetterHelp would have been a great side gig rather than Uber for a lot of those people. It puts less wear and tear on your car, that's for goddamn sure, right? And it helps them stay within their field, you know? You, you want to try to make sure that all of your jobs are building your career. But also, here, here's the, the, the thing that I think is amazing. Being a counselor, or being in the behavioral fields at all, it takes people to be able to make a practice, right? You have to live in a metro area. You have to live in a, a place that has high population density in order to survive. Companies like BetterHelp, which are helping... Uh, mainstream telehealth services they are making it so that I don't have to make you know a six figure salary in order to live high on the hog there are plenty of rural areas that are beautiful that I would be able to live in making just $15 an hour right and that's one of those calculations that people really have to make in their life some people would rather live in the middle of the action, in the middle of Denver, you know, having the Pepsi Center and Red Rocks for concerts and, you know, having every sort of store imaginable within, like, a 20-minute drive when it's not uh, rush hour, you know? I'm one of those people. I love my high-speed internet. Right? I'm, I have a gigabit line now. And so when I'm at home, I can upload, you know, five gig movies to YouTube and not even be able to, to finish the tags and titles and make everything perfect and get my thumbnail in there before the time that it's already uploaded and processed. I love that. Right, and rural areas don't have that yet. But there are people who would love the peace and, and, and peace and quiet, and just the clean air and less hustle and bustle of rural areas. Right. As soon as rural areas have gigabit internet access, I'll be one of those people. I'm kind of like a you know a, 
a buffet style, you know, cafeteria, pick whatever I want out of the, the situation kind of guy. With, with a high-speed internet access, I could live just about anywhere and, and not fucking give a shit about what's going on around me. Even if there were cows, and the cows shit, and it smells, you know, it, if I have a gigabit internet access, I'll be like, well, you know, rancher got to make money. <sighs> they were out of pumpkin spice at 7-Eleven today. Anyways, what I see BetterHelp as doing for people in, in the behavioral fields is they're opening up the ability to live wherever you want, right? As long as you're licensed within the area that you're practicing, you can live in the most rural parts of your state now and make a, a decent enough living that you can make ends meet and maybe put a little bit away for uh, retirement, you know? There are different economies here in Colorado. Like, in Denver, you just you just could not afford to live on BetterHelp pay, right? You just can't. It might be a good side gig for keeping your uh, ability to do counseling if you have to take a job where you're not doing a lot of uh, long-term counseling and you're, you're doing a different job in behavioral health. It might be a good thing to keep your, your uh, licks sharp. But uh, Colorado Springs, I don't think, would be a very good uh, place to be subsisting on better health pay either. But Pueblo, uh, La Junta, Canyon City, those kind of places, well, Trinidad maybe, not Canyon City. Canyon City has a different economy to it. It's got a whole bunch of... Uh, million dollar farmers and uh, people who are on the federal dole for being uh, jailers and whatnot for their federal prisons or supermax prisons. So there's a little bit different economy in Canyon City. But Trinidad, Pueblo, uh, Sterling, you know, really remote places, as long as you have a decent internet connection, you would be able to make enough to live on doing better help. And that is great, you know. Kind of the way that, you know, you, you don't like that Uber and Lyft ruined, you know, the career taxi cab driver's uh, financial future. But it also kind of gave a lot of people access to a job that, you know, they don't have to be vetted on other, you know, issues, and, and they don't have to pay for a medallion to get in there, you know, it's, it's, it's opened up a gig economy to where people don't have a contract of having to work, you know, a set amount of hours for a cab company. And so they can be a little bit more versatile, especially if they have, like, children at home and they're, like, uh, they were a one-income family and now they can be, like, a one-and-a-half income family. You know, it's been really good for a lot of people. So there, there's good and bad to a lot of gig economy jobs. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I guess those are my thoughts on the matter today. Uh, I'm going to finish up the next three hours of driving without you guys. And uh, hopefully, you know, with cell phone service being what it is these days, even in the mountains, maybe around Aspen and Vail, I'll be able to have this video uploaded so you have something to watch from me today. And then tomorrow, I will recap what happened in the hearing uh, that happens 1 p.m. today. Laters.